people watching later online will also not be ignorant people. But you see, God very clearly gives that warning, doesn't he? That if we ignore those sort of things, he will ignore our children. And it's one of those things that we as believers are desperately going to need in the days lie ahead. And in Hebrews chapter 6, it says the following, Therefore, leaving the discussions of elementary principles, which Nigel mentioned last night, let us go on to be perfection. How many of us want to be perfect? Well, I certainly want to go on to perfection. Am I perfect? I really do want one of, one of those T-shirts that said, Perfect man under construction. None of us are there. Some of us are further down the road than others. Some of us are just starting on the road. It doesn't matter if we had the right desire to go on to perfection. And it says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Various issues, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And if this we will do if God so permits. We need to be those who are on the journey, committed to the journey, going down the journey and moving on day by day with God. But just to clarify one little thing, and that is there is a difference between fruit and gifts. If you read in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, if we had a week of mornings, we'd have a look at fruit as well as gifts, but we don't have time. Can I just say, the fruit of the Spirit is all about character. It's all about what we are. It develops over time. It's great to see the apples on the apple trees out there. We'll be back in October, Nigel. But one of the things about it is, is that those apples haven't just appeared. You know, if you go down the garden centre and buy an apple tree, and it might be about this big, you might get one apple on it. And of course, the first year, what you should always do when you plant an apple tree is actually pull all the apples off. So that it establishes its roots, so that, that it fruits properly thereafter. But you see, one of the things that's important for us is that the fruit is what we are, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit is something that is given to us by God. And that's important that we, we look and understand the difference. And there's another thing that I just want to clarify as well. And that is there is a difference between gift and gifting. Okay, the gifts are for the now, as I've put it now. So we'll, we'll look at that and see how that applies. Gifting is where you see the fruit of it. It's a ministry and a calling. For example, I mean, we know Nigel is an evangelist and he ministers deliverance to people. That is his gifting, if you like. If ever I want an evangelist, I'll call Nigel. Okay, I know that I can do evangelism, but I don't consider that to be my gifting. God spoke to me years and years ago and enlightened to me 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4, where it all talks about teaching God's word. And I feel that is, that is my gifting. I hopefully... You can witness to that. If you don't, please shout at me and I'll shut up. But you see, we have to know it. You know in your knower what is your calling. I remember years ago, we had a lady in the church who said, I really feel God's calling to be a worship leader. The church very bravely let her have a go on a Sunday morning. Can I say to you at the end of Sunday morning sea service, I know my gifting is not a worship leader. <laughs> but can I say we can learn from that? Great to her that she was prepared to come back and say, uh, no, that's not me. That's vitally important. I was involved with a PGC trainee recently at school. And can I tell you the one fault? He will never be a good teacher because he won't acknowledge where his faults are. He's not prepared to listen to anybody else. He thought he was perfect when he arrived and proved far from it. But as Christians, we need to know those things and be able to move on from them. I know, for example, also that God calls, called me to the gift of administration. Hopefully, we've seen a bit of evidence of it over the years. I think 21-odd uh, years of running Bible weeks, I hope I've learned a few things over the years. But I will say, honestly, that was all of God's. And it's been great to work with, and the important thing is to work with a great team, as we'll look at later on. But can I just flag up, as we get into this this morning, there is a danger that we assess people on their gifts and not on their character. 
There are ministries out there, you can go and look them up on YouTube, and you can look them up on their website. I did a little bit of, uh, Helen and I share a YouTube account. Goodness knows what she thought I was looking at the other week when she goes and looks at the library. But you see, I decided I'd just do a little bit of research, and you still out there are ministers or people who proclaim, proclaim to be ministers of God's word doing amazing signs of wonders. They will shout and they will scream and there will be people falling here, there and everywhere. They have a huge, they've got a great charisma, great platform presence. They have a huge following. And yet, what are we finding as we look through the Christian press over the last 20 months? How many of those people who would say they were, we would say were great have fallen? Character failings. I mean, I just, we just reminded you, remember the, the preacher from America with the big boots and the tattoos? While he was having ministry meetings on the platform, he was sleeping with his PA. You know, flawed character. God wants us to be those who have good character so that it shines through and we're able to use the gifts correctly. And 1 Corinthians 12 says the following. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. It says here, You know you were once Gentiles, carried away with these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you, no one speaking in the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. One of the things I'm working on at the moment is a series on the Corinthians church, some background. But as I've looked at it, one of the things you have to realise was that Corinth was a great place of idol worship, if you realise nothing else. And actually, what Paul was saying is, some of the world had started to creep back into the church. He says, although you were Gentiles and they worshipped idols, and there are idols, there were idols and temples everywhere, if you look through, just look below the surface, you can see that actually it was starting to creep in, and a mixture was coming into the church. If you look at some of the sections... So we need to be those who actually move on in the things of God. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, and let's pick up on that here. And 1 Corinthians 12, this is our core passage, if you like, for the next three mornings today, and Monday and Tuesday. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. It says, there are differences of ministries, but the same law. There are diversities of activities... And the same God who works in all and through all. You see, we have three things here, don't we? We have giftings, we have ministries, and we have activities. All are good before the Lord under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And verse 7 it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given each one for your individual growth? No, for the profit of all. Where we see, we need to see growth in the church. And then verse 8 picks up and it says, To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and to another workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernings of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretations of tongues. But verse 11 is paramount. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one as he demands. No, individually as he wills. God is the giver of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What concerns me greatly is when you have these meetings, and I was looking at something from a big youth ministry school in America, on the, whichever coast it is, not the East Coast, the West Coast, you'll know who I'm referring to. I watched this video about them practicing prophecy. And they were randomly picking numbers that came up on their phone and then going and prophesying over that person. So if you know, we'd have, we'd have two and we'd match up and I'd prophesy and you'd prophesy. What? The Bible very clearly says you can't turn it on and off. Or am I misinterpreting that verse? It's distributing to each one as he, as God wills. We cannot turn these things on and off. So we need to make sure that we are those who are doing it according to God's will. But you see, the Bible refers to gifts of the... I just want to clarify something before we get into the individual one. The Bible refers to the gifts of the Holy Spirit in four major places in the New Testament. 
And that's where you'll find them. You'll find them in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 in two places, and Ephesians chapter 4. And what I want to do this morning is just as a start, I want to actually flick through and I want to actually look at, we're primarily going to be looking at the middle column there. But I just want to look at the others to clarify to us the difference between gift and giftings and how they relate in the church. So let's have a look at the first, let's, I'm going to start at the, the, the far end with Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 down to verse 16 says the following. It says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and the edifying the body of Christ. That's what it's for. It's to build the body up. And it says, Until we come to unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we should be aiming for. We're aiming for perfection, and Paul mentions it here. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. If we know God's words, then we won't be those in the days that lie ahead, perilous days ahead, when we're going to be trying to be pulled in this direction and in that direction. We won't be. And it says, look, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies, we can't survive without each other, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for edifying itself in love. Absolutely amazed as I've been watching some videos recently about the immune system in our bodies, how wonderful that is and how it works. Um, just amazing what God has put us together and yet he wants us to be together in just as such an amazing way as his church. But you see here he says, he talks about putting some together and if you look, if you look at that particular list, it started with apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher but actually if you go the other way up the list, that's how a church grows, isn't it? You have a small group who have a teacher. Maybe the church grows and you have some pastoral needs, so therefore maybe you have a pastor comes in or you appoint somebody as a pastor or somebody gets the pastoral gifting. You then obviously need to grow a bit further and you have the evangelist and then you have the prophet who has prophetic words in and eventually you get the apostle. But one of the things is, is that the apostle is somebody who has oversight, maybe of a group of churches. Can I say that is not imposed? It's not somebody who says, I'm the local apostle, I want to come and oversee your church. We've seen it happen. But you see, that is vital that that doesn't, that doesn't happen to us. Can I say, anybody who says they're an apostle needs to have that sort of conditions that Paul had, didn't he? In 2 Corinthians 11, I didn't put it in there, but I added to my notes. And if you, I just read them. You know, if you get somebody comes to you and says, I've got an apo, 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 apostolic ministry, there we go. Ask them how many times they've been beaten, how many times they've been stoned, how many times they've been sick wrecked and spent time floating at sea. And if they can't come up with any of those, I would say I would question whether or not they've got the ap apostolic calling. But actually, in reality, if they don't have God's calling and anointing, what happens? They start to manipulate what's going on. They have to dominate to get submission from the people. And then it moves to control. And we've actually seen that over the years. And can I say, what does it bring in the, in the congregation themselves? It brings insecurity. It brings fear of not doing what the apostles said they ought to be doing. That legs too, don't we? It's called witchcraft and Jezebel. But you see, we need to make sure that we look at the fruit in the lives of those people. So let's look at Romans 12, just to clarify that one too. Romans 12, 6 down to 8, it says, And having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality, he who leads diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. 
And it talks about here, about ministry. It talks about the ministry. That is a gifting. Years ago, we had somebody in our church who was absolutely fabulous at sorting the building out. They've moved up north now. Nigel and Lynn, will know, we know who we're talking about. Was always down the church, sorting something out and doing sort of bits and pieces. Had a cupboard full of tools, paint tins, everything. You know, if a bit of paint got chipped, it was touched up. We know who we're talking about was a deacon in the church, absolutely fabulous. That was his calling and was happy in his calling. We talk about those who give. Um, I love the phrase, you know, the gospel is free, but the plumbing costs money. Sorry, Nigel, I've nicked that one off you. But it's true. And people say, oh, you know, they quote that verse about the Bible that they say, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, the love of money is, but money isn't. And I look at that, the case that um, years and years ago on the south coast, somewhere between Bournemouth and Brighton, was a second-hand car dealer who was a Christian. And people came from all over the country because they knew they would get an honest deal. And can I say, he sold thousands of cars. He was probably the richest man on the south coast. And he put huge amounts of money into the church. And then somebody said to him, oh, but you've got all these people come and you share the gospel with them. You ought to become pastor of a church. There was a little group who met in his house and they said, you ought to become pastor of the church. So he gave up the second-hand car business to become pastor of the church. Can I say one thing? He wasn't called to be a pastor, wasn't called to be a teacher. And it was a disaster. And can I say the business went down the drain for the person he sold it to. What had God called him to? Sell second-hand cars to Christians, mainly Christians, honestly, and he made a bomb. And he poured that money into missionary work across the world. And can I say the church was worse off because he gave up what God had called him to. An honest living, bring in income, they can then put into the church and we mustn't um, decry that and it says here and I just wrote this one down mercy with cheerfulness those who visit the sick and the elderly maybe call them over the phone you know an ever open door that cup of tea that is always ready that you know the pot that never cold it goes cold maybe the postcard that gets posted to people the letter the email just ringing up the phone and ringing somebody. That will take you all day if you're doing that. Somebody, somebody God puts you on there. But it is an essential ministry. And people decry it. And so there's the list from Romans 12. And let's, let's have a look at the next one. In front. At the end of 1 Corinthians 12, it says the following. In verse 28 through to 31. To the gifts in a minute. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, gifts of helps, gifts of administration, varieties of tongues, are all prophets, are all apostles, are all teachers, all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? No. But look what it says, and I'm going to keep coming back to verse 31. But it says, eagerly desire the best gifts. What is the best gift? The best gift is the one you need for now. Not the one that you need in a fortnight's time. What you need now. And you see, God wants us to be, and if we look at that list that you've got there, if we look at that particular list, I know full well that, and Helen and I said this years ago when we were challenged about whether we should continue to run the Bible Week in, at Top Barn, and we determined that we would continue to run and administer the Bible Week so that people like Greg and Nigel and John and one or two other people had a platform that they could minister to people and people would go away changed. And that we would see the fruit in people's lives. All of those people, how many of us like a cup of tea? That's the Ministry of Helps. Don't decry it. One of the things we learned over the years and, uh, was that when people arrive on a Bible week, can I tell you the one thing, when we first arrived at Good News Crusade, we arrived first time in Malvern with GNC back in 93, I think it was, 
within two minutes of us arriving, hot and sticky in our car. We'd been queued to get on the site for hours. You know what somebody came up with? Two cups of tea. I can, I can tell you that spoke volumes to us. We didn't know anybody. We knew there were lots of people and we knew that there was a couple there who came and they, they just gave out cups of tea. You know, don't decry that because that's important for the body. Um, so let's pitch in to where God wants us to from 1 Corinthians 12. And let's start to have a look at these particular giftings. So 1 Corinthians 12 says, There are diversities of gifts but the same spirit. Different ministries, different activities. And from verse 8 it says, For one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Gifts and healings by the same Spirit. To another, workings of miracles. Prophecy, discernings of spirits. Different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretations of tongues. And it's God who gives them to us. Can I say, and I'm not going to mention this, but the next bit, and I don't want to miss this out, there's the next chunk before we get down to the bit at the end, is all about the body. Interesting that Paul talks about individual gifts, ministry gifts, and in the middle he talks about the importance of the body. That's a whole message in itself. I've I've put it there because I want to say I'm not ignoring it. You know, I had somebody who I shared some of this before, and they said, oh, you missed that bit out. No, the body is important. The gifts are for the building up of the body. So here we have the list, and let's actually pitch in and start to get into them. So what I've done is I've divided them up into three groups because this is where I feel they rise together. We've got the revelation gifts, wisdom, knowledge and distinguishing between spirits. We've got power gifts, faith, healings, miracles and the vocal gifts, prophecy, speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now we've got our list. Let's see how far we get into it as we look this morning. And we're going to try and look at, we're going to look at wisdom and knowledge together because I feel that that is it. They, it's almost inseparable. You know, you can't have a word of knowledge without the wisdom about how to apply it. So let's have a quick look at some, some verses. Some definitions that knowledge gives us facts and wisdom shows us what to do about those facts. Wisdom and knowledge, there is no as I put it there, no definitive divide. It's like colours in a rainbow. If you've ever seen a rainbow, you know, the interesting thing is that the real rainbow is just a continuous line, not like those individual colours that we see on various places. You see, God is continuous. God is not divided up into bits and pieces. And Proverbs 15, 7, it says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. Look, wisdom and knowledge pulled together in Proverbs. But the mouth of the fool pulls forth foolishness. And Ecclesiastes 10 said, if the axe is dull and does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. I always remember years ago, somebody lent me a chainsaw. In the early days, before, before I really knew much about chainsaws. And I took this chainsaw to try and cut this log. Yes, I had got appropriate PPE. Could I cut through this log with this chainsaw? All it did was generate smoke. You know what I realised? You have to sharpen the chain. Once I sharpened the chain, boy, did that cut through logs nicely. But you see, one of the things was, was that I lacked knowledge. And I didn't, and when I knew what I had to do and then learned how to do it, that brought success. So, word of wisdom, here is a definition, I think I've jumped on one, yes, there we go, there's the definition for the word of wisdom. Can I say the definitions I have nicked from Derek Prince? I'll make no bones about that. There is a book entitled The Gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you want to read it. Brilliant book, but he's got these definitions and I think they fit fabulously. And he puts the supernatural revelation or insight into the I put diving, it means the divine will and purpose showing how to solve any problem that may arise. Maybe we do need to dive in. But let's have a look what it says. Primarily in James chapter 1, anybody who's ever been in a 
Christian trustees meeting will know this is what I pray as we start our meetings. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without approach and it will be given to him. If we honestly come before God in circumstances and situation and ask for wisdom, he will give it to us. Some versions say abundantly. But you see, I've also picked out from the Amplified, um, favourably known in our house as the Extra Jesus version, you know, because you get all that extra, don't you? It says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and in abundance without rebuke or blame and it will be given to him. If we come honestly before the throne of grace and say, Lord, I have a circumstances, I have a situation that I need to look at, God will grant us wisdom. And that's important. But one of the things is in Ecclesiastes 3, it says the following, in the, in, for everything there is a time and a season. I'm a great believer in times and seasons. A time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Interestingly, I spoke to a Christian recently who I consider very wise, lives in Worcester. And he said over the events of the last two years, he doesn't believe that God has allowed anybody to die before their time. And I think that's, that, that really brought a peace and it resonated with Helen and I. And I think as we go forward, it is something that we need to trust God in. We recently had somebody in the church who came back to, whose husband died. Uh, but a fortnight before he died, he came back to the Lord. So we know where he's gone today. And I was sitting there because I was doing the tech side of the funeral and, and it was a lovely event. But as the family gave their tributes, they said, oh, he was a great Reading football supporter and he was always down there on a Saturday and he'd go to away games sometimes on a Sunday and he loved his family and would travel all over the country to visit them and they couldn't understand why he'd been taken. And I sat there and I felt God said, because God doesn't want him to slip away again. And I went afterwards, I was the only person from the church who went back to the house and the relatives were all there, you know, they were having a few and the bottles were going and they were celebrating his life. And this guy's wife came up to me and she said, I said and she said to me, she said, you know what, she said, they're all very sad that my husband has died and I'm not going to mention his name. And she said to me, she said, and for a while I struggled as to why God took him and didn't heal him. And she turned around and said, she said, I know that if he'd been healed, he would have fallen away again. And I said to this lady, that's exactly what God showed me earlier on today. You know, and God allowed him to die. The family were, who aren't believers were going, why, why, why? But actually, where did God want him? He wanted him in heaven. He didn't want him, because he'd made a commitment years ago, and football and family and work and all that sort of stuff had gradually pulled him away from God. And God had brought him back to himself and said, right, now's your time, I want you upstairs. And I think there are times, oh, by the way, I haven't written this down by the way, there are times when I think we need to trust God that he knows more than we do, well he does. But we need to be very, very careful sometimes, I'm going to say this, how we pray into circumstances and situations. One of the things we need to pray is, as we were mentioned last night in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and I think that's important that we do this in the days that lie ahead because to do anything else you're praying soulishly into somebody's life maybe actually and believe me you can turn things around and make things happen that maybe aren't God's will at that time at time it allows things to happen and I believe you can sorry that's not in the notes but there we go that's a little aside but you see, it says here, let's go back, and it says a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build, build up. And verse 7 says a time to tear and a time to sow. And this was the thing, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. It's important that we know, sometimes God will give you a revelation about something, but now is not the time to share it. And can I tell you, I've been there, it's as difficult to keep quiet as it is to say it. 
but you have to wait until God says, now share that. And that's important. Here's some examples. I'm not going to read this all the way through. You can look it up for yourself from 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. If you remember the two women who were harlots and they had a child and there was an, one, woman, one woman, they, had, they both had children, then they? And one died. And Solomon came up with this idea, didn't he? And that's cut it in half and you're going to have half each. But right at the very end, and it says in verse 28, it says, All Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered and they feared the king for they saw what? The wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. We need to be those for whom people see the wisdom of God working in our lives. And in Matthew chapter 2, we have the following. If you remember when the wise men, the Magi, had visited Jesus, and it says in verse 13, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Can you imagine, Joseph, they'd already travelled, hadn't they? Down from Nazareth to Bethlehem. They were living in Bethlehem. What do you think they wanted to do? For me, I want to go home. You know, there are times when we've, we've uh, had fabulous times at Bi the Bible Weeks. But I'll be honest with you, we reach a point where you get to Saturday morning and what do you want to do? You want to go home. But what was God saying? He says, no, don't go home. Now go on another journey. Go out to Egypt, even further away. But you see, then he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Didn't hang around until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. You see, Joseph had a word from God that he had to act on. And that was important. And then we find in Acts chapter 6, the following. Here we have a problem in the church. And it says, in those days the number of disciples was multiplying, there rose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Can you imagine? It must have been great to have a growing church. How many were the thousands in the church by now? It said, because the widows were neglected in the daily distribution, some say, of bread. This was a food to the widows. Because in Jewish culture, you know, the widows had to be dealt with by their families. Now they were in the church and the church decided to feed them. And the twelve then summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. Look, can I say, if you're going to deal with matters in the church, being full of the Holy Spirit is important. You know, you can paint in the Holy Spirit. You can put the chairs out in the Holy Spirit. I always used to remember um, the days when we had the Bible weeks at Top Barn and sometimes uh, prior to that at Weybridge. Myself and a guy by the name of Andy Chappell, some of you may remember Andy, we used to lay the chairs out. The company who lent us to the chairs in Weybridge says, yeah, we can bring a team in and lay the chairs out for you. And Andy and I used to say, no, there was a reason why we laid the chairs out. We prayed over every one because we knew that we need every single person who sat on those chairs, we knew, and we prayed that they would go from that Bible week different. And that's important. And I'll be honest with you, the night when sometimes when I'm preaching in the church in Three Mile Cross, what do I do on a Sunday morning? Somebody says, why are you adjusting the chairs? Aren't they all right? Of course the chairs are all right. There's nothing wrong with the chairs. There's nothing wrong with the spacing. That's not the point. And I remember years ago, and I'm, uh, I'm, we heard a case. Some of you, do anybody remember the gentleman by the name of Clive Calver, who was the director of British Youth for Christ? They moved into a new area, and their children went to the local primary school. And God said to Ruth Calver, buy a bread maker. Now, they were really stuck for money, you know. He was running a ministry, British Youth for Christ at the time, didn't have a huge amount of money. And God said to them, buy a bread maker. 
And I, Ruth Calver said she, she, she really sort of struggled with this because they weren't cheap things to buy a bread maker, but in obedience, she bought a bread maker. And then God told her to make bread. Well, that's what you do with a bread maker, isn't it? And she made this bread every morning. God said, make a fresh loaf of bread every morning. She went, okay. So they did, and by faith, they bought the flour and every day. And then God said to her, cut the loaf in half, pray over it, and then give half away every day at the school gate. Within six months, we had a church meeting in that school. There were people being healed, there were people coming to the Lord, simply because of her obedience to buy a bread maker, and she prayed over it, the God, that as they ate the bread, they would discover the bread of life. And they had a church of about 200, nearly 300 people started to meet in that primary school within six months. Because, because she did what God had told her to do. So let's carry on reading. We may get finished. And it says, but you see, we need to be full of the Holy Spirit just to do the simple things. We did, I'm, I'm not getting very far, am I? But this has come to another reminder me. Years ago, uh, we were unit leaders with Good News Crusade on a Bible week and basically used to get this list of people. Helen and I remember, you got this rather antiquated dot matrix printed list through the post of all the people who were going to be, quote, on your unit. Let me just explain. When you got two and a half thousand people on a campsite, what they did was they divided people up into groups of about a hundred people in what they called a unit and you would have some past, that's how the pastoral input happened. We were unit leaders, we had a unit team and we got the list and were told, right there, you've got this bit of ground, arrange it wherever you think so that you sort of, you had to pray over your list to put people next to people. And we prayed over this list and we, we put people around us. And at that point in time, we were struggling to have a family. And we prayed over this list and we put over, and we were there in our tent. And guess what there was all the way around us? People who were on IVF. Did we know that? No. And I'd sat there with me, bit of graph paper, and I'd numbered my list and I got my grid, and I just literally put people on the little squares, and we went down, and it was, the, and the, it was really, really hot that summer, but all around us were people. We'd gone looking for God to minister to us. Guess what? We ended up ministering to the people around us. How little did we know God was going to break through th three years later, but there we are. But you see, we had to have wisdom. We didn't know these people. All we knew was, you know, Fred and Mary blogs Grimsby. We knew nothing more about these people and maybe with their children, you know, as a family or whatever. But you see, we needed the Holy Spirit and wisdom as we... Looked. But you see, here is a case, simple case. And let's keep reading. It says, but it, we give to ourselves to give because the apostles wanted to give themselves continued to prayer and to ministry of the word. And it says, because they did this under the Holy Spirit, look what happened. And it said, the saying pleased the whole multitude. That was, that's a miracle. If any of you have ever been in church business meetings and somebody proposes something, oh, don't ever change the carpets. And then they chose, it says, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Hochorus, Nikos, Simon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, an apostolic from Antioch. And they set them before the, the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And look what the fruit of it was. And it says, and the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at the results of picking some guys full of the Holy Spirit to distribute food. So any of you who think you're going to serve tea and coffee this week, you better be full of the Holy Spirit. That's serious. Because it's a serving ministry. And look what happens if you do it in the church at home or do it there. You can see multiplication when you do something under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There are a whole lot of others. I think I've listed them there. I'm not going to dwell on that. What I will say is that I'll get Matthew at some point to put this PowerPoint on the Hope Barn website. So if anybody wants any of it, they can sort of go back to it. Uh, the PDF will be there. So let's have a look at the word of knowledge. 
And here we go. The supernatural revelation of divine knowledge or insight in the divine mind, will or plan, and also the plans of others, that man could know himself. Okay, there's some interesting things that come out about that. Let's see it in action. And I'm going to, the first one is from 1 Samuel 3. I'm actually going to fly through that one. Okay, if you remember the way a case where um, Samuel heard a voice, didn't he? Three times. And right down the bottom in verse 8 it says, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli. And he said, Here I am, for you did call, call me. And it said, Eli perceived. Some versions say, And Eli knew that the Lord had called the boy. And in verse 9 he says, Therefore Eli said to Samuel, and this was, the, this was the, the wisdom, the knowledge, if you like, the knowledge was the first bit, and wisdom he said, Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And in verse 10 it says, The Lord came and stood, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and he answered, Speak, for your servant hears. You see, there was an example of what was going on. But this is one I particularly love in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 8. I think this one is brilliant. It says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware, do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And then the king of Israel sent someone to the place which the man of God had told him, and thus warned, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So basically the scenario is that the king of Syria was making plans and God was showing the prophet, the man of God, exactly what the king of Syria's plans were. Because look what it says in verse 11. It says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that he speak in your bedroom. A number of years ago, I was driving down the M4. I was, I was late to go and visit my parents the other side of London. So I was heading down the M4 from Reading. I'd gone past Junction 7, which is one of the turns off to Slough. If you remember, the one that used to smell quite badly, if you've ever done that journey, doesn't anymore because the sewage works. And then you come to junction six, and as I'm between seven and six, I felt, God, I felt this word said to me, get off the motorway, get off the motorway. And if you know that bit, there's three, it's about three minutes it takes you to do between seven and six. And the word kept saying to me, get off the motorway, get off the motorway. But I said, but Lord, if I go up through Slough and the A4 and the traffic lights that, you know, you can only do 28 mile an hour, it's going to take me forever to get home. No, the motorway's clear. And this mo the voice said, get off the motorway, get off the motorway. I went, all right, Lord, indicated left and pulled off the motorway. At the corner of my eye, I suddenly saw bits of car flying up in the air. So I went down, round the motorway and back onto the motorway. And we missed a very, very serious accident. I cite the example also, Reinhard Bonnke, and if you remember Reinhard Bonnke when he was out in Africa, they used to go to place to place and they had a massive tent. And on one occasion they, were, they had the convoy and he was in the front vehicle and there was this small child who wanted to, remember the state, I need a wee! So there was a sort of petrol station and the whole convoy pulled off all these vehicles because one small child wanted to go to the toilet who then managed to get himself locked in the toilet. Reinhard Bonnke tells this story that he said he was not particularly very gracious towards this child. About 20 minutes later they got back on the road, on this, down this road, and these were roads that were covered in dust in South Africa. They were going down the road and they hardly got going when they came across the wreckage of four trucks. Because if you know, they have these great big road trains, you know, the sort of road trains where you have a tractor at the front and you, if you haven't seen any, go and have a look. You have a lorry at the front and they have all these vehicles, they just connect them up. And somebody in another lorry had gone to overtake the road train. And there'd been a serious pile-up. Guess which coach would have been 
in that place had this small child not needed to go for a wee. And Ryan Harbonke, he openly said this, I remember saying it in Birmingham years ago, he said he had to go before the Lord and apologise for his ungraciousness towards the parents of the small child who locked himself in the toilet. However, he said that was God's provision. And God's, God, God had sort of said, God had said, he, because they, he just said he'd passed a lemonade bottle back apparently and said, yeah, we'll keep going. And God said, no, this child needs to go, let them go. You know, we need to be those who are sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. And this, this case that we've got here is a case where God was revealing what was going on so they could actually sort things out. And we've got some other things here. And in, in one of my favourites in Matthew chapter 6, where Pete, you know, Jesus had challenged the disciples. And who do you say that I am? And they would said, you know, man says this and man says that. And then Simon Peter comes up with this one. In, and he says, and Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We need to have that knowledge burned in our hearts. And you see Jesus in, in John chapter 1 and verse 47, early on in his ministry, Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. We need to be able to sense and know God's wisdom and God's knowledge about people. And in John chapter 4 it says the following, When you remember Jesus was ministering to the woman at the well, and the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, that I come here to draw. And Jesus said, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And said, you sound very well. Because you've had five husbands and the one you're with now is not even your husband. You spoke truth in. And Jesus, the woman said to Jesus, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We need to be those who have words of knowledge when we're doing evangelism. Jesus did. And look what the fruit of it was. And you see, we also need to know those, those words of knowledge when it comes to ministering to people. And it said, and Peter said to, this was Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back pride to the price for yourself? Do you remember this couple? They sold a house. Was there anything wrong with selling the house? No. Was there anything wrong with saying, right, I will give 50% to the Lord and we'll keep 50%? Was there anything wrong with that? No. The problem was that they had said what they'd given to the church. They'd said, that's all of it. They told a lie. And you see, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, had this word of knowledge and said, you know, why has Satan filled your heart with the Holy Spirit? To lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. Was keeping back half the problem? No, the lying was the problem. While it remained, it was not your own. After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this in your heart? You have not lied to, you've not lied to men, but to God. So a great fear came upon the church and all those who heard these things. And then in Acts chapter 9 it says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, who said to the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. And behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. You see, God told exactly what was going to happen, exactly how it was going to work. And as a result, the church multiplied. You see, the word of knowledge brings conviction. God doesn't give us revelation for the sake of it. Years ago, um, I, we had some healing meetings at our church. I may have told this story before, and this is why I'm going to finish this morning. We were trying to pray for somebody and one of the local vicars had brought his daughter to be ministered to. His daughter, this was in November, and his daughter had been on her period since July, and she was 14. She'd been to all sorts of medical people, and I can tell you, she looked like a sheet when he brought her forward for, for ministry. And she came forward, and myself... And somebody else was praying. I think at that time it was, some of you remember Ruth Drinkwater, Ruth Evans, you know. And we were there ministering together. And we just couldn't get a breakthrough. There was nothing happening. And I know Nigel shared the example. And suddenly, well, I just prayed, Lord, show us what's the issue here. 
And immediately she took her hand and she went like that with her hand. So her right hand went down and this friendship band dropped out from underneath whatever she was wearing. And I said to her, what's that? And she said, oh, this is friendship band. We made them at this Christian camp we were on in the summer. And I said to her, that's your issue. I said, we need to, you need to take that off. She said, well, I can't take it off, you know. We have made this covenant with my friends. So I said, it's that or healing. So her dad turned around as the local vicar. He'd got his sort of collar on, was sat next to her. He said, he said, she's got to, he turned her and said, you've got to take that off. And she went, I can't. So we went in, into the church kitchen, into the tool drawer, all church kitchen, all churches have a drawer that's full of junk. We have one at home, you know, you know the tool drawer. And got the big pair of scissors and went, tried to cut this with a pair of scissors. Couldn't cut it. In those days, I drove around with sort of 25 kilos of toolbox in the back of the car. Remember those days? Don't anymore. But I went out and I got a pair of wire cutters, a pair of side cutters that I had in the car. And managed to cut this with a pair of side cutters. And can I tell you, immediately her colour came back. And she said, it stopped. She knew that she'd been healed. But we'd had the word of knowledge. The interesting thing was, then she then revealed that her friends are all in the same circumstances and situation. Christian camp. But you see, God gave wisdom and revelation that brought healing in her example. So you see, one of the things is, is that wisdom and knowledge go together. And it's important that us, as we, as we in the days that lie ahead, we as Christians know what to do and what not to do. A few months ago, I was driving to school, and I will finish with this one. I was driving to school, and I'd got about three quarters of a tank of diesel in the car. And as I'm driving to school, God said to me, fill up the car. I went, no, I'm on, this is on a Friday. So I finish at 12 on a Friday. I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll get the diesel on the way home, you know. I was running a bit late and I wanted to be in sort of about 25 past seven. I'm normally in by half past seven. So it was a, and I thought, no, no, and we had this tussle again. But in the end, I went and bought some diesel. I thought, okay, Lord, I'll, it means I'll leave at 10 past 12. We'll, we'll, we'll work the time. I went and bought diesel and filled the car up. When I came to leave school, I left school about quarter past 12 and I'm driving down through lower early, there is a monster queue. And I turned around and I went to go the other way and there was a monster queue the other way. And I, so I pulled over and I got my sat nav out, I got the phone out and had a look and it was red all the way round Asda. And there's a BP opposite Asda. So I thought, well, that's a bit strange. Yeah, there's a news report at about quarter past 12. So I turned on Radio Berkshire to listen. They said, oh, by the way, avoid all petrol stations because, do you remember when BP suddenly said there was a delivery issue and everybody went nuts and bought diesel? Everybody remember that? Everybody was trying to buy diesel or fuel wherever they could. But you see, God gave me a word of knowledge about that. And I, if you like, I obeyed. And that's important for us. It's going to be very important for us as we do in the days we lie ahead. That when God says, you know, if you want to go shopping, you know which shop to go to. Because I went into Asda the other week and there was no chicken. When does Asda not have chicken? I've never ever seen no chicken in Asda. Have you anybody noticed that there are shelves? You go in some weeks, so there are, there's not so much of this and that and the other. As Christians, we're going to need to know where we need to go to get our shopping. Or what it is you need to fill the shelves in the garage or under the bed or whatever it is you need to do so that we are prepared for the days that lie ahead. So there we go. We've had a look at wisdom and knowledge. And on Monday, we'll have a look at discerning the spirits because that's important. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that each one of us, you want us to be equipped for the days that lie ahead. And so, Father, we just pray that for each one of us this morning, we will have something that we can take away from this morning's message that we can apply to our lives. That, Father, we will be those who are prepared for the days that lie ahead. That we'll be able to use those tools which are in the toolkit, which you will give to us as and when we need. Know which... That, Father, we...
move on in you, moment by moment and day by day, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy your tea and coffee.